forth his servant. And we thank God for all of us that are together. God has bringing us as one family. And we are one body. And so today, a man that I, I highly respect and loves the Lord has a sweet, gentle spirit. And today he is going to minister to us. And so congregation, shall we receive the ministry and the blessing from Pastor Matthew Carrotin to come and share the word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. What we have here. There we go. So good morning, everyone. So I'm going to take the advice and the, the counsel that I received as I prepared today's message and share with you guys one of the things that I struggle with. And we'll get into the reason of why I'm sharing that with you as we dive into today's word that I've called living together in the light of God. But I thought I would actually be obedient to what I'm going to share with you today by telling you how difficult it actually is for me to stand here. I am a introverted person. I am a technology guy. I love servers. I love server rooms that they shut with heavy doors and noise and that, that drowns out all distractions and other things. And the whole idea of standing in front of a large group of people for whatever reason makes me tremble with fear. And my friends know it and my family know it and my parents knew it when I was a kid. And so they, being good parents, and I consider them to be good parents, they saw that fear in me and said, nope, we're not going to let that stand. And they actually had me up in front of people a lot. So Pastor Sean asked me to share with everyone a little bit about myself and a little bit of background. So quickly, I grew up here in this area. I am an Anne Arundel County guy. My family has been here in this area for five generations. So I have roots here. I love this place. I am connected here. I love it. And I want you guys to know that because we're all family. Right? So to know your family is to know your family. So we grew up, I grew up not too far away from here, over by Arundel Mills, before there was Arundel Mills, before all of the craziness that happens over there in that area is where I grew up. Our family, uh, they belong to a church that's over there called St. Mark's United Methodist. And St. Mark's has been there for 180 years I think at least the church itself has been in existence. And my parents made sure that for every youth event, for every children's choir, for every, uh, you know, play, for anything that somebody was doing, they were like, hey, do you have an opportunity for, for, for little Carlton to go up in front? And they made me go up there and do that thing. So for the, the younger folks who always wonder, why do my parents make me participate in stuff? This is why. Because whether my parents knew it or not, God had a calling on my life. And the people in the church and the family that were around me recognized that call, and they would constantly remind me that one day you would preach, and one day you would share God's word. And I ran from it because it scared me. The idea of this, the idea of thus saith the Lord, the idea of let me talk to you about the challenges that you're having in your life and let me pray for you was scary. But it wasn't until I actually listened to God, stopped running, and actually embraced what he gave to me, what he put on my heart, that I understood one thing. That while I might fear it, Carlton, when God moves, there's peace. There is joy. There is comfort, even in your uncomfortableness, even as you go outside of your comfort zone, God brings peace. So that is how I will introduce myself to you guys this morning, and let's pray and get right to work. Amen? Amen. So Father, I thank you this morning for all that you're going to do, for all that you have to say, and for all you have to share. God, I'm grateful for the long walk and the fact that your arms are not so short that you couldn't get me even while I was running. And God, I'm grateful that for everyone that's here in this sanctuary today, that your hand is over them. 
that they would only have to be prepared to allow you to change them from the inside, that you would bring peace, you would bring restoration, you would bring recovery, you would bring change that they can't even imagine. And so God, we thank you and I thank you for everything that you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I entitled today's message, Living Together in the Light of God. And we're going to be in the book of 1 John. And we're going to be in the first chapter of 1 John. So I'm letting you guys know that because as a a former professor, I like to give homework. And so I want to share with you guys, take your Bibles out this week and finish up 1 John. I cannot do all five chapters in one Sunday. And I want you guys to understand that God has unpacked something for his church in this book. The book of 1 John was written to the Ephesian church, a church of believers who had been believers for a time, for a long time, in fact. We're talking about believers who were generationally believers. They had a familiarity with Christ that was easy because mama and daddy believed. So I'm sure you guys can relate. Some of you in here can relate. I went to church because mama and daddy made me go to church. I went to church because my grandmama was, made me go to church. Whatever the situation you found yourself in, you have, just by the virtue of living here in the United States, a easy familiarity with Christ. Travel the world. If you meet someone who is international, and I know this is an international worship center, right? Overseas, the default for American is Christianity. Now, we might think it's different here because we have lots of different religions here and we have lots of different, you know, ethnicities and backgrounds. But overseas, the idea of an American that you must be Christian, okay? And so we live in a culture that is permeated with Christ, but not always embracing him. And that was who John was writing to in this, in this letter to the church He was writing to them to remind them of what God was doing. And one of the things I always do before I begin to prepare for a message is ask myself a question. And the question is, what is the chief end of man? Meaning, what is our purpose? Why are we here? And the answer to that question is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. In everything we do, we do it for the glory of God. And while that answer might be easy to say, especially for me, because I've repeated it to myself over and over and over again, that doesn't mean that it's easy to live out, especially not in a culture that wants to change the answer away from glorifying God to glorifying ourselves, Uh a culture that wants us to change enjoying God forever to enjoying man forever and the things of man and the things of this world. But we need to remember not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. Because I, myself, Pastor Carlton, because I make sure not to point my finger out, I point my fingers at myself, okay? I am not someone who is worthy to speak God's word. God has made me worthy. Hallelujah. It's not because of what I have done. It is what God has done. And how God has changed me. Because left to my own devices, I wouldn't change. Think about it. I am so nervous to stand up here in front of you. And yet God says, go and share my word. And so I do out of obedience and deference to a God who saved me out of my sin. But our culture tells us to do what's easy for us and to stay away from it. Our culture has even designed itself so that we can uh, uh, build and craft an image of ourselves that is so perfect that it drives people crazy. Okay, so think about it. You come to church in your Sunday best. You walk through the door and someone says, good morning, and you ask how you are, and you say, well, I'm blessed of the Lord. And yes, you are. So don't, don't forget that. Okay, yes, you are. But I know that there's at least one person in here that when they walk through the door, they weren't thinking about how blessed and highly favored they were. So my question to you is this. Why didn't you tell the person that asked you how you were doing the challenge that you were having when you came through the door? 
Because that is the opportunity that First John is going to unpack for us, is that that's the opportunity for that person that you interacted with to say, wait, let's stop, let's pray. Let's stop, let me help you in your situation. But because you covered it up, it's like, hey, you're blessed and highly favored. Well, I'm blessed and highly favored too. High five, let's keep going. But in fact, you're carrying a weight that you weren't called to carry. We craft images of ourselves that are, that are too perfect. So perfect, in fact, that it makes it look as if we've forgotten our first love. That's why in Revelation it tells us, it, 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 it charges the Ephesian church that you have forgotten your first love. You study and you share and you talk about the things of God but you have forgotten your first love. You can tell people when their scripture and their theology is inerrant, but you have forgotten your first love. And that is the charge given to the Ephesian church because this is the thing that happens with easy familiarity with Christ. We start to want people to like us. We want to share a gospel that everybody can embrace. We want to be liked by the culture, our friends. We don't want people to look at us crazy. And so we water it down and we hide it and we don't share the parts of the gospel that we think will be unloved by people. But we shouldn't do that because eventually, no matter what, every Christian should have a story of when their life hit the wall of Christ. Because you can walk and go to church. I went to church for years, for decades I went to church. But I didn't know God. It wasn't until God met me in that moment where my, my pretense, my falseness, my tie and shirt and, and everything hit that moment where it was like my sin that I'm hiding, I cannot go any further. And it wasn't until I shifted that idea, till I began to embrace what God was doing and what he had done when he saved me, that I could even embrace his calling on my life. I tell you guys, I ran from God in a way that when we have time to sit down and talk, I can tell you amazing stories of leaving and running and how God still met me in every place that I stopped. In every place that I stopped. But let me get into the word of God. Now, I've got this remote here that they gave me. And we'll see if I can make this work. All right, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. But in Acts 20, 29 through 30 is where Paul has reached out to the Ephesians. He has started the Ephesian church, and he gave them a warning. The warning being that fierce wolves would come and that they would come and be in there and they would cause problems with the message. They would begin to water down the gospel. They would begin to change the culture, and things would begin to shift inside the church. And it says there in verse 30, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. And you can tell, you know, if you've walked this life long enough, that there are those who would say that you should change what the gospel is. You should change what the Bible says, because then you'll be able to draw more men unto you. But changing the gospel is not an option. Go to Revelation and see. That's not a good idea. Amen? Amen. Amen. Changing is never a good idea. So 1 John 5, 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. And that is the key of everything that you ever share, that you ever do. That is the, the meaning of any message that I ever share with anyone is that they understand that they have life. Anytime I speak to a church or another believer, I want you to know at the end of that conversation that you have eternal life and that you can have assurance of that because there are many who wonder, am I really saved? And that's a good question to ask because then it gives you the opportunity to examine the fruit of your life. It gives you an opportunity to examine how you interact, examine your walk, examine, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's a great question to ask to other believers. So now back to 1 John chapter 1. 
That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Now, John knew Christ. He was talking to a church that did not have direct connection to Christ. A generation different. The grandchildren of that original generation that were there in that church. They did not experience Paul. But John is writing to them to counteract the idea that someone else has a secret knowledge of Christ. There was a cultural thing going on there where different groups of people were trying to influence the idea and the understanding of who Christ was. And we even have that very same thing today. They call it the Gnostic Gospels, right? So the Gnosticism came from that time. That time period there, you had people who believed, you had uh, the, the Stoics on one side who believed we could overcome the sin of the body through sheer force of will. I will hold myself to a, such a degree that I will never sin and I will be sinless for the rest of my life. Sheer force of will. And then you had the Epicureans on the other side. And the Epicureans were the ones who said, I will overcome sin by just indulging in everything so that the grace of God can abound to all people for all time. I will eat what I want. I will drink what I want. I will take whatever I want. I will do whatever I want because I can get over it in my own strength. Both ideas were false. They believed they had a secret knowledge that had them change the way things were set up and the way that people understood who Christ was. Even during that time, they, would actually, they actually preached that Christ himself was two separate beings. That Christ, there was Jesus the man, and there was Christ the, the divine. And that when Jesus the man was baptized, Christ the divine came down and rested on him in the spirit of a dove. And then he became the divine Christ. And when he went to the cross and he died, Christ left the man Jesus. And we know that to be untrue by the word of God. We know that to be untrue. But they pushed that idea because it made it more logical to a culture that believed in logic. It made it make sense to people who said, this Christ thing that you guys believe is crazy. Oh, if we would only understand the parallels and how history repeats itself. And so John here in the beginning is making a call back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he's also referring back to John chapter 1 where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John was making this point to the church to say, these people who are talking to you do not, they didn't touch his hands. They didn't walk with him. They didn't know him. I know him. And you need to know him as well. And he was laying out that foundation for them as he began to talk to the church about what life lived together in the light of Christ would look like. 1 John chapter 1, verse 2. The life appeared... We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So he's letting them know that I know Christ. I don't think that they do, but I do. So I write to you with the authority that he's given to us. Verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Make our joy complete. Knowing Christ and walking with him makes joy complete. But only when you walk that out together. You cannot do it individually. It's not something you do by yourself. I know that the culture, our American way, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you go and do it in your own power, in your own strength. But I tell you today that that is not the truth. 
God said we live this out together. Ko- koinonia, right, is fellowship. It means having common understanding together, walking together in a common unity. That's what John is sharing with the church here. He's saying you've got to live something out. And he doesn't just leave it there where he says, well, just live it out together. He actually says this is how you do it. As we continue on in verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness. He says to walk in the light of Christ. But what does that mean to walk in the light? Has anyone ever walked in under a bright light? So like right now, I'm in this stage, right? And there's all these lights here, right? There's nothing hidden when you stand in the light. There's no hiding. There's no keeping things away. Everybody can see the fact that, you know, I, I, I like cake and I like desserts, right? I can't hide that from you. No matter how many Facebook posts I put out there about actually getting on my bike and riding 20 miles or swimming a few miles in the pool, all of that, none of that matters because in the light of what you see before you, you see that that is probably not happening as much as it should. But walking, (laughs) thank you, but walking in the light means that you share everything, that people understand what's going on in your life because it provides illumination and warmth. And a light can be described in a lot of different ways. But the thing that I like the most about light is in verse 6, is that light banishes darkness. Verse 6 says, if we have, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So that means by walking in the light of Christ, if you are hiding something behind you. Now, it would be very easy for me to hide something behind me for the reasons I mentioned a few minutes ago. Okay. However, by walking in God's light, there is nothing hidden. And that goes back to my conversation in the beginning. When I walk through the door and you see me, that's why I don't want anybody to ever be surprised, right? Because you might see me and you go, hey, Pastor Carlton, how are you doing? I'm going to tell you. And I want you to be prepared for that. Because there are things that happen in life that I need you for. And that I try very hard not to hide things. I don't want to hide anything. I don't want to hide it from my spouse. I don't want to hide it from my kids. I don't want to hide it from the church. I don't want to hide it from my parents. Because in the end, it always comes out. When you walk in the light of God, it shines and it shows everything. So if we walk together as a family in the light of God, you have to be prepared for the fact that there will be moments where someone will see something and they will say something because they should. That's why you have pastors. That's why you have small group leaders. That's why you have a men's minister, a women's minister. That's why the youth have a youth pastor and they have youth leaders and they have all of the different components, right? And you have a spouse that sits next to you and you have a friend that you talk to at work. The reason why they're there is because they're helping you to walk in the light of Christ. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You are not stuck in your sin. No matter where you find yourself this morning or yesterday or last week or wherever you find yourself on Monday or into the weeks ahead, You are not stuck in your sin because the light of Christ, the blood of Jesus covers and walks and purifies us of all sin. And God illuminates that for us. He shines it out in front of us. He makes sure that it's there and that we see it and that others see it. And then what do we do, church? Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We have to confess our sins one to the other. And that is a burden on both the hearer and the speaker. Because for the speaker, I know it's hard. I don't want to share with people my stuff. I don't want to tell folks about 
the things that I struggle with. And I want people to know those things. They, they, they're messy. They're ugly. I, he fixed my pen. So that's the struggle for the, 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 the speaker. But for the hearer, it's also a struggle because you have to be ready and prepared to not recoil in horror at the things you will hear. Because that is the one thing that we, I charge the church with is that when you hear the sin of someone else, we tend to, oh. No, that's not, that's not my thing. I, I, I don't want anything. You, did you hear that? Or you call your friend and say, oh, well, let's just pray for so-and-so. But if we are to walk in the light of God, we have to embrace one another, even in our mess, even in our struggles, even in our pain. We have to embrace one another. That is not to say that you don't call sin, sin. That doesn't mean that you, you know, uh, sugarcoat the fact that when you accept Christ, you are caught When you accept Christ, he knew you were a sinner. So your sin is not a surprise to God. And that doesn't mean that our brothers and sisters who struggle in certain ways that we don't talk about in polite company. That doesn't mean that you just go away from them and tell them that they're no good. Because the idea is that, well, I can't tell you about my stuff because you're one of those Christians. And that is not who we're called to be. Hey, I'm a, I'm, I'm a pastor here, right, Pastor Francis? So as your pastor here at, at Calvary Chapel, guys, I never want to hear that someone from Calvary Chapel uh, was just like, hey, get away from me, you're disgusting. I don't ever want to hear that. Because that's not what we're called to be. And again, that does not mean that you don't call sin, sin. That doesn't mean that you don't share what God's word says. That doesn't mean that they don't then have to make a choice. It just means that we deal with people in a way that brings them in. And then let God, dis- let, let God handle the rest. It is not for us to convict. It is not for us to drive someone to repentance. God does that work. Mama G leaned over at me before I walked up here and said, let the lion roar, right? (laughs) And, And the thing is, the Bible is the lion. Christ is the lion of Judah. He doesn't need me to make him sound good. Let the lion roar. You don't try and like fight for a lion, right? If somebody's going to come and get the lion, right? You're not going to like, well, let me stand between you and the lion because I don't want, you know, I don't want, you know, I'm going to stop you. No, get him. (laughs) You want him bad enough, get him. Because God will take care of the rest. He will change them from the inside out. He will call them to repentance. He will change their soul. His blood that he shed before we even thought about talking with that person covered that person's sin. So that is what we do. And that is what we share. All have sinned. All have fallen. There is none that are worthy. The best man is a man at best. The best man is a man at best. Let God handle. Let God do it. Chapter 9, or verse 9. Maybe. I'm hitting buttons up here by accident. All right. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. His word has no place in our lives. Have you ever thought about that? If you tell people that you've never sinned, do you know you make Christ out to be a liar? 
if you could do it on your own, why did he die? And if you think by your own strength you can save people, he didn't need to come to earth, die, and be raised from the grave. You have made your Lord, the Lord that you claim, you have made him out to be a liar. By making yourself more righteous than you ought, you have said, I've got it. Because no matter how Holy Ghost filled you are, there is always a moment where you're going to have to go back before Christ and repent. And I can tell you, if you ask any of the older saints, the ones who have walked with the Lord for longer, the longer you walk with Christ, the more you realize the sin in your own life. The more you see it, no matter, even if it's been so long before you did that thing that you, you know, was the, the sin of your life, right? Even if it's been a really long time, it, you still see how great God's sacrifice on the cross for you is. He died for the sins that you didn't even know, and didn't even conceive in your mind as sin. He went to the cross when you had no desire for him. And again, I'll talk about me. When I had no desire for Christ, when I didn't want him, when I was running from him, when he was sending people my way as I went from one side of the country to the other, I was still, no, God, no, no. And he was still pursuing me. And then I moved halfway back from the other side of the country and landed in a place and still, God was still pursuing me. To the point where somebody came to me at a, at a church in Houston, Texas and said, when are you going to stop running? <laughs> and that person didn't know. They didn't know what I was up to. At that point, I was even acting like a good boy in church again. <laughs> when are you going to stop running? And I said, you know what? I think I should. And God began to work on me and he began to remind me of what he was doing and he began to show me who he is and how great is his faithfulness. And we can only overcome it by the finished work of Christ. As we go into 1 John chapter 2 and I begin to close this out says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. Propitiation, he paid the price. And it was the perfect price. It was a righteous price. It was a price so great that it didn't just cover the mess of Carlton, it covered over the mess of the world. Uh, (laughs) So that anyone who would believe in him would have life eternally. Jesus Christ came to the earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross and he rose again so that you would never be lost. Lost, alone, away, no longer having fellowship with him, wandering around in darkness, grasping for what you should do next, and Lord, where am I going and what's coming in my life? You will never be lost. You'll never be alone. On those dark nights when the walls are closing in and you don't have uh, uh, somebody to get on the phone and call or you, you know, you can't just turn over and speak to the person next to you because that person's gone and has been gone for a long time. God is there to say you will never be alone. not only would you never be alone, but you would have eternal fellowship with him. A friend who sticks closer than any brother, but a king who sits on the throne just to make right the pains in your life. A king who heals and a king who doesn't heal, but a king who is just and merciful and loving. You will never be away from him. 
you cannot be snatched out of his hand. He's faithful to forgive. He's faithful to hold on to you. He's faithful to present you to himself worthy. And Jesus came to earth. He died on the cross. He rose again so that you would have life. Real life. True life. Not the fabricated life that we build on Facebook and Twitter. Not the pretty pictures that we put on Instagram. Not the, 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 the Christmas cards that we send out where everybody's smiling and everything looks beautiful. Not the shirt and tie that we put on on a Sunday. But that you would have true life with him forever. Now that doesn't mean that there won't be difficulty. Amen, church? That doesn't mean that things won't be difficult. That doesn't mean that you won't have trials. That doesn't mean that you won't have struggles. Because Christ said you will. But what he did say is that you've got a family now that you can talk to in those moments. That when you see one another, you can be honest. You don't have to hide. Connect with one another. Get to know one another. Because Christ has given you life. So we stand together as a family. Embracing one another. And sharing who God is. Amen? Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, I thank you. Because God, you knew what needed to be said this morning. You said it in the worship songs that were sung. You said it in the offering time nuggets that were given, God. You said it in the exhortation that went out. You said it in the cafe this morning when we connected one to the other. You said it when people were embracing one another and seeing things, God. You knew everything that needed to be done. So we are grateful that we're able to be in your presence. We're able to worship you in spirit and in truth. That we're able to know you to a greater degree. So God, we pray that you would continue to work on us. That you would continue to be our Lord. That you would continue to be our guide. That you would continue to make the crooked paths straight. And that we would be able to walk not in darkness, grasping for ideas and thoughts. We would walk in the light of your truth. Seeking out each other. Helping one another. Praying for one another. Hugging one another. And sometimes just being silent and listening to one another. Because that is what we need, Lord. That is what we need. And in Jesus' name, the entire church body said, amen. Church, did we receive the ministry? Hallelujah. What a powerful time. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. You know, this is a powerful message that some of us, we we need to reconnect ourselves to God in a more transparent way.